Um, okay. Last lecture before Easter. Complexity, fractal, scale invariance, emergence, and the brain. This is the longest title I've ever put on a on a on a lecture, and I. I uh, was a bit of an experiment for myself to t t tell you um, some ideas that actually are my research area and that, that will hopefully um, occupy me for the next five years and maybe um, talking about it helps probably. So not all of that is relevant for the exam, let's put it like that, but all of that is interesting. While we are at complexity, um, I had a number of emails questioning about questions about the essay. That's obviously at everybody's heart. Um, we maybe spend a few minutes a question and answer session of anything that we can discuss and that everybody can hear it is better than an email form one on one. Shoot. What do you want to know? Friday is the deadline, 5 o'clock in my office. I actually asked our student office, but they haven't replied, so that they don't really feel responsible for that because it's a university module. So I decided I do the, the, the deadline, the handling in myself. So you can put it either to me in my office or you put it in my pigeonhole, which is just next door to my office, which is in building 13, it's a tizard building on the fourth floor. Some of you have been there already. Can we not email it? Yeah. Yeah, you can email it as well. Yeah. Email as, as well. well. Do, you as well? Do you need a hard copy? No, I don't actually need a hard so copy. If you get it into a Word document or a PDF, I'm quite happy to. Yes. yes, you can email so it to me as well. Would yeah. you prefer Word or PDF? Don't matter. Don't, don't come here. Can I do it to you now? No! I've got a three days to work on it. <laughs> After today's lecture, I'm sure you will complete that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, Good practice, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well done. So I hope to feedback. Uh, well, within the two weeks, but at Easter in between. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll might send you feedback by email. Otherwise, you get feedback the first day we meet again after Easter. Yeah. In writing. Second. Whenever. Whenever. Whenever is fine. You. Are kidding me? <laughs> you know what the it's effort? Four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll do a beep, a beep I just today. said feedback whenever. Huh? <coughs> you know what pressure we get from the from the student the national student yeah. feedback um, of the deadline of feedback. That's the single most important thing that determines student satisfaction. Yeah. And we are under strict guidelines to give feedback within two weeks of the submission. Okay, so two weeks is fine. <laughs> that's really great. <laughs> that's, that's really good. Really the school of audiology, yeah. that that's your policy. Faculty of uh, engineering. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's the faculty. Yeah, I think that's a yeah. university. Well, except, yeah. except, except it's never been taught. Many that people that miss it. For, um, it depends on the time of the year when you do it. should be fine. The marks that just sent to the mail. Really? Is, so this is this film the Yes. Yeah. 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 So let's, so let's stop it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just amused that people don't care about yeah. that secret. I don't know where that is. I do, I do care. I care. Like, if you don't get it to us during the yeah, 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 that's what I, that's what I, what I understand, of course, yes. Um, do you have, like, all you see it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> Obviously. Um, Obviously. <laughs> if you do have any figures embedded, so they are in the six pages, right? Yes, all figures need to be hand drawn, well, made by yourself, whatever you, way you prefer, but must not be copy pasted and they are part of the six pages. The only thing that isn't six pages is the reference list. I really don't care which reference style you, you use, unless <coughs> what I do care is that you use a style that con conveys all of the important information. Yeah, so my recommendation is APA, Harvard style, but there are plenty of styles that achieve the same. Okay, because at the moment we're going to use APA, but we've obviously got 1.5 spacing and 11 font when APA serves a different font. Is that okay? The 
Yeah, twelve. Oh. Twelve. Oh. What's that? Only in first class you double twice you double twice. Do we want a don't get hung up on this. This is for mother. Have you got an abstract? I don't think you have um, an abstract is good practice. Since this is yes, if you if you if you if you want to do it, then yes. If you haven't done it, don't worry about it. Um, but it is good practice to write an abstract. We I don't usually call it an abstract because it's not a scientific paper. I call it a summary or an executive summary, which is one paragraph of what you say, what you have done, why. Uh, what you've found and what your conclusion is. This is by far the most difficult thing to write. And that's why I don't usually take it quite serious, because it is usually crap. Um, but it's a good exercise to do it. But you don't worry, I, I, if you, if you d don't get that perfect first time around, I don't, I don't mind. This is, a, as I say, it's a good exercise to do it, and I'll give you feedback on it, because it's so difficult. Okay. Yeah? Go ahead and do it. There. Are you writing these marks for not including it? No. Do we need a title page? You, no. you can. Again, it's actually good practice. So that title page is useful if you give it to student office and then you have a page with your big name on it and then they usually lose the first page and it's good as this up to the yeah, title yeah. page. But it's important to put your name and your, uh, the title on every page and the page number at the bottom. Yeah. You'd be amazed how many people forget that. And there's also good practice, learn that okay. forever. Then if you submit copy. something electronically, give it a good name. So give it a, 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 your name, if oh, that would be best. And name not just um, yeah. final yeah. submission yeah. three. That's useless. Yeah, it is useless. So you want our names on every sheet? Yes. In a running head? Or yes. <laughs> okay. Or in a footer. <laughs> or in a footer. Well, that's good practice. <laughs> It's good practice to do that, yes. You don't, you're not getting marked down for that kind of stuff, yeah? I see that as being as an, as an introduction for your essay writing because I know that everybody comes from a completely different level and I'm trying to teach you something or I'm trying to, to tell you what the university standard for that is. Some of you might have written seven essays already and you're very good at it, but some of you might not. And I don't want the people that already had so much exercise to get much, much better marks for that. So that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is how much effort you put into that. And if you come from a very low level and you get up to here, that gets a better mark than if you come up from here and show me this improvement. Yeah? And why you Okay? Any more questions? No? Cool. Okay. So, my favorite lecture. Here's my question. What have these in common? So I'm trying to reduce the light. Yes. Oh, I've tried to find the ones that actually match in color as well. Uh, didn't I do well? I consider that artwork. So this is, this is a tree. <coughs> yep. The Japanese cherry tree. This is a neural network. You've seen some of that. This is what's called a fractal, which we come to in a second. Anybody got a guess, wha guess what that is? Where's that physicist? No? This is a picture of um, um, black energy in the universe. It's a modeling picture. On these are the, um, the, the galaxies are in between the, the black dots. So, they obviously have something in, 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 in common, mm. otherwise I wouldn't show them to you. Uh, and looking at them, there are some structural similarities. In fact, what, we, what we're going to discover is that there are some geometrical similarities, which are called um, fractals. As these are fractal uh, geometries. So what, what is a fractal? H who here has not heard of fractals? Good. Oh, good for the cause of the, because I will spend 10 minutes on fractals. <laughs> if you know all about them, um, that's a bit pointless. Fractals are a never-ending pattern that repeat themselves at different scales. Hello. This property is called a self-similarity. You look at that and you don't get hypnotized, you see immediately what I mean with self-similarity. Because this is, these are triangles, obviously. And uh, this will not stop ever, so don't w wait for it. But you'll see 
it is self similar because every bit is the same as itself so we're zooming in like a microscope if you like that is um, a common feature of fractals. Fractals are extremely complex meaning that you can zoom in for forever and ever quite the same shape. Amazingly fractals are extremely simple to make so here's another fractal that you have might have seen. This is a leaf. Leaves and trees are very typical fractals and an algebra there's one that we'll discover in a second as well um, and how are fractals made? By repeating a, a simple rule over and over and over again. We'll talk a lot about the rules today. Here's some natural fractal, fractals and how they develop, namely through branching. Branching is the rule, namely we start with something and then we branch. i come to that in a second. Fractals are found all over nature, spanning a huge range of scales. We'll talk about scales a little bit today as well later on. We find the same patterns again and again, tiny branching of our blood vessels and neurons of branching to trees, lightning bolts and river networks. Regardless of scale, these patterns are all formed by repeating a simple branching process. So what the fractal actually is, the picture here, doesn't tell you so much about what it is, but it tells you something about the process that generated it. It's especially good here, the, 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 the lungs. Um, which are obviously tree-like structures. If you put that on a head and, and, and you paint it green, you could, you could see that as a tree without a problem. Because they're solving the same problem. And this is what, what, what fractals are about, or fractals here in nature, why we're talking about them. Not because they're beautiful, because they're solving a problem and they are, are simply everywhere and they're obviously also in the brain. Hence my, my lecture about that today. Um, the, 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 the problem that lungs and trees both solve is uh, they want to cover a large surface area or a large volume with the smallest amount of material. The problem that neurons in the brain form, practically, is to connect m the most connections with the smallest amount of material. Again, here's some more examples of this um, branching. This is it's called Lichtenberg lightning, and I just point out the scale. That's 10 centimeters. That's a tree, that's 30 meters, and that's the river delta, that is 300 kilometers. So again, we're zooming in, completely different things here, but don't worry, because obviously they have something in common. What do they have in common? The rule that, is gen that has been used to generate them. Now, there's a very simple thing here that already, uh, the, the take home message, if you like, if you want to explain or you want to redo that, in a model or whatever, you need a lot of information. You need to know the river is here and here, but not there and here. But if you only have a simple rule to generate that, you only need a very extremely little information to reproduce that. Not exactly, but a very similar thing. So instead of, this is sort of a reducing of information. So rather than saying, I want to have exactly that pattern, saying, I want to uh, produce a structure that covers the most volume with the least material. That gives you a, a, a fractal. Here are some more, just because they're beautiful, not relevant for our uh, arguments, but I find it fascinating where you find them. Like the same, this is the uh, 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 hurricane, 500 kilometers, and it looks strikingly similar to a galaxy, which is 10,000, 100,000 light years. Obviously, one doesn't know about the other. And they weren't created as such, they were just assembled following rules. And obviously these rules are what we're after here and what they mean. Okay, one simple rule, because I'll show you a little video of that in a second, because it's pretty. And don't take this equation too serious. I don't want you to understand this equation, but this is just the last example of a, of a fractal. And I think everybody should have seen something like that. So this is, that's while, it, while we wait, this is the result. It's called a um, uh, Mandelbrot set by a guy in the 70s who discovered these, um, which are the result of an equation
that it updates itself. So you, you just do an iterated process and you calculate a number as a squaring a number and add a, uh, an, an, a constant to it with the only difference that these are complex numbers and not real numbers. If you do real numbers, it's boring. And then you count how many times it takes before it gets to a certain level. And depending on the, how many counts you count, you give it a color. And the result of that looks like that. Here's our structure. Don't take the music too serious. It's just dramatic. Maybe I should switch off the music. And it zooms in. It keeps zooming in. selected this video because of the music, I think, subconsciously. There are plenty on, there, uh, on, on YouTube. This is not random. This is not chaos. Nothing in here is random. This is all math that fits into one line. And a few months of calculations. Anybody here ACDC fan? No, you're all too young, are you? <laughs> and I stop it here as well. Next time we see one of these Mandelbrot sets, I stop it. It's too fast for me. Anybody hypnotized yet? You look very closely at these bits here, they are indeed itself um, the same structure that we started off with. This is called, and, and, and German has a very nice name, Apfelmännchen, apple, apple person, um, looks a little bit like an apple, and it's, this is a self-similarity, yeah? And what, you, what, what, what I want you to take away, I mean this goes on nine minutes. <laughs> zoom in and in and in. It never, never ends, yeah? That's the whole point, it never ends, and, and just the opposite, it always repeats. In a, in a strikingly uh, complex manner. And r again, the rule that produced that is this. I don't do much math in here, but I expect you to understand that kind of rule. And this is not a very difficult rule, is it? And that produces this set. Right, wh why, wh why is that important for us? Why, why do I tell you all of that? Apart from that, it's beautiful. Because it gives us first an understanding of scale <coughs> invariance. This is what, what I'm trying, this is what I'm starting off with and this is what I'm going to end with. Scale invariance, meaning whatever scale you look at it, you can zoom in and in and in and in, it will always look the same. It can be complex the same, could be simple the same, like the triangles, but you always get keep it complex. It should give us some understanding of complexity. Did you think that was complex? Yes. Something simple can be complex. Simple rule can result in a complex result. Um, my word here is my sentence, deter determinism is that. If you learn physics in school, you learn about Newton, you learn about Einstein, you learn about equations that are usually linear, and you learn if you have the, a, a description of a system, you can describe the system physically. That is not true in the real world. That is only true in the artificial world of physics or mathematics. In the real world we have something which is called the butterfly effect. And that is if you, if you need to know the starting position of everything in your system to know where the system is going. Let's take the most famous example of that is a three body example. What is it? Um, the sun, the earth, and the moon are three bodies. And if you only have the sun and the earth, you can calculate forever and ever what the, where the earth will be at any point in time. If you add a third body in there, you cannot calculate that algebraically, analytically. Why? Because you need to, we can calculate it for any given amount of time, but depending on the starting point, the results will vary after some time. 
And remember this and the term of starting point. What is the starting point? How exact do you have to be on the starting point? Yeah, we zoom in and in and in, and the system looks completely different. So d depending on what your starting point is, if it's here or here or a, a millimeter or a micrometer or a nanometer left to the to the side, it will have a different outcome. That's the butterfly effect. We cannot that we cannot deterministically determine anything. Certainly not in the in, in, in the real world or in the brain for that matter. Everything it's not chaotic. We come to chaos in a second, but it's not deterministic either. Knowing how parts of a system work does not explain how the system functions, exclamation mark. We know the rules. We know the simple rule, but we have no way in the lifetime to understand the complexity or to look at it even. Yeah? You can, we, we can dabble around with the rules of anything, but we cannot hope to understand every, everything that comes out of that. This is a property called emergence that we come to in a second. Right, what is complexity? It's hard to define. Actually, if you look what, what, what complexity, how complexity uh, things are defined usually, I define it here for our purposes as complexity is what happens when many agents interact with simple rules, but usually only at a certain point of parameters where the system is not boring. Um, here's our example. We have a bit of water, a cube of water, and we put heat underneath. And if there is a little bit of heat, you have a nice gradient of heat. So you've got hot here, you've got cold there. Okay? That's what's boring. If you have too much heat underneath, the system will boil. That's chaos. Chaos is difficult because we cannot predict anything. There's no patterns in there. And, um, well, ca leave chaos beside. We, we're not talking about chaos. But there is always a sweet spot in the middle where something interesting happens. This is called the critical point, and in this case we have uh, so-called Bernard convections. Uh, you might have seen them. If you look at, you can't see it in boiling water or in just boiling water because water is, 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 not, is too transparent, but every liquid does that. You get these blobs everywhere. They, they uh, go up and then they go down again. It makes really pretty patterns. And they have a number of, of interesting uh, uh, parameters uh, and interesting uh, effects that we that, that, that makes them interesting. This is boring, this is boring, this is good. Critical point. Now, these critical points are what's called phase transitions. And we all know phase transitions from water, because we've got water that can be ice, can be water, can be gas, ignore the plasma, and um, it, can, it, it, it does that as a function of temperature, I'm sure you all know that, but it does that also as a function of pressure. So you can take, for example, water at 50 degrees, and you uh, increase the pressure a lot, it will go solid. It will go twice. If you put, you need a lot of pressure for that. Don't usually do that. But that's the reason why on Mount Everest water boils mm -hmm. at 80 degrees or something because there's less less pressure. But there are special points, triple points, critical point here, uh, that are called the um, critical points, where something interesting happens. Namely, you've got all points next to each other, all phases. Here's you've got the solid phase you've got the liquid phase and you've got the gas phase. And at this point, something in nature takes over which is called power laws. And we'll, we'll see some of these power laws now in, in, in action. That have been first described, I think it has been first described, at when, when people start counting something. And um, you know, for example, earthquakes, there are many more small earthquakes than large earthquakes. And if you put all of these earthquakes, earthquakes are usually measured uh, on, on something called a, a Richter scale. And if you, if you have a system or a, a measurement device um, good enough, you, you find that everywhere, earthquakes. When there's a car passing by, you've got an earthquake. But it's a very, very small one. So that would be Richter scale zero, 0 0.1, something like that. Um, but if you count over a long time, more of these, you'll find, got, um, and y y you plot that now, always on a logarithmic axis, um, you find that you've got a lot of small ones and fewer big ones. And if you, if you put that on, a, this is actually a logarithmic axis, and you put that on a logarithmic axis, you get this straight line, nice straight lines. And uh, every time we see that, we have what's called a power law. 
because this happens to be described by a, by a function of the power of, 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 of this one, the dependent variable depends on that one to the power of something. And the, the power of something is usually here given by some exponent. Okay, that's true for earthquakes. Um, something more interesting one. Uh, believe me or not, but almost anything that you count will follow that law. It's certainly one of the most famous laws that nobody has ever heard of. Let's take um, participants of how many um, updates Facebook users do. And you get a lot of people that don't do anything, read, that do a little bit, you get a few people that do a lot. If you plot that on a logarithmic logarithmic axis, it will be a power law. It will be a straight line. If you count web pages on the web and count for how many web pages, how many links go to that web page, plot it log log, you get a straight line. There seems to be something behind that, a simple law. This is very simple. Something connects these two things um, that is obviously not connected to well to earthquakes or to what generates that, but this seems to be a law in nature that just emerges from something else. Do you have more examples? Yes. This is done. This is Zip law. A guy called Zip. He counted um, James Joyce Ulysses. Have you heard that big book, two hundred thousand words? If you count the number of occurrences of the word the and you plot that on a graph, you find that every tenth word is the, 0 0.1, it's the probability of occurrence. The second most uh, frequency word is of, and, and, and to, and I, and so on, and so on, and so on. And one of them here, at least used as quality, is a thousand most important, actually this is, this is abbreviated there, but 26,000 words in Ulysses, so you can make that, you can carry on and on and on and on. But the point is, it becomes a straight line. Did James Joyce do that by accident or by, by, by definition? It's not only James Joyce. This is every book in every language. For me, very interesting is, is this um, also power laws called 1 over F law, which is the same thing, uh, which is power spectrum. What do we have here? We have um, Scott Joplin piano classical radio station, a rock station, and a clock <coughs> station. And what we measure is a power spectrum in small bits. And we ca calculate how often is a radio station, how loud. And we distribute that, and a wonder, a wonder, they will be always, they, they are, they're offset of each other, but they're well described by a straight line, which is very, very parallel to this 1 over f. So what does Scott's Joblin and the piano to do with the power uh, with, the, with, the, with the radio station, or with the classical um, top radio station. Nothing but physics. And the physics that's behind that is still not understood. You do not find any explanation why that actually is the case. It has got something to do with scale invariance, and it's certainly got something to do with um, the way that things organize themselves. And it's got something to do with our fractals, because they are also scale invariant. Where's the scale invariance in that? Well, this is a scale. Independent of where I look, at this scale, or at this scale, or at this scale, I will always find the same function. OK. So that's a miracle. Where do we see it in, in, in brain? See it in the, uh, in the development of a brain, for example. The connection of neurons and the cortex, um, and if you measure how far that cortex nor <coughs> neuron project to neighbor neurons, you'll find that most of the connections are very, very small. We remember that from last week, it's a cortical column. Almost all of the connections are in the cortical column, but some of them go further away. So here's, here's a typical neuron. We've got some, most of them are very, very short. Some are go further away. If you plot that for a large number of neurons, it, it, is a, uh, it follows a power law. Um, the power law is described by one parameter, namely how steep it goes down. And there has been recently, 
an understanding of um, things that you wouldn't associate with that immediately, namely, for example, autism, where autism comes from. Because if you measure the, this parameter, the single one parameter, describes how far neurons project within the cortex, it shows that in autism, people suffering from autism, um, this connection number is smaller. So they will make more connections. They have the same number of neurons, they have the same number of connections, but the distance that these connections are, are just a little bit steeper. Which means their cortical columns can probably process better specific things, but it's harder for them to make wider connections. There are very typical gender differences with that as well. Namely, the, 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 this number is slightly bigger for women as for men. Women have bigger corpus callosum, that's the connection, the bridge between the left and the right hemisphere. And as a consequence of that, they have more longer connections, significantly more than men. And all of that is described by one number that describes how steep your power law really is. Is it either that, or that, or that? So this seems to be a powerful way, a powerful thing that nature uses. Here's actually the equation of our power law. That's the only equation that I give you. <coughs> y equals m to the uh, x to the power of b. Complex systems seem always to adhere to this law. It always pops up. And I've given you five examples. I could give you 500,000 examples. I could give you the example, for example, um, how far the friends on your Facebook page live away. Most of your Facebook pages, friends, will be, on average, that's not always true, but on average, will be close. Some of them will be further away, very few very far away. People have um, ah, lots of these rules. This is connected to, to the fractal rules because it is the same rule depending on very far and very small. So there's the same uh, scaling proper properties there. It means there is no typical event. There is no typical number of friends that uh, somebody has on Facebook. Oh, th this is also one. If you, if you count the number of friends that people have on Facebook, you find that very few have very many, <coughs> and many, many, many have very few. Or the income distribution of population, in fact. Most people have very little income, very few people have a lot of income. It fa follows a power law. There's no typical event. Why is that so? Because it must be the result of an emergence, uh, emergence properties. There must be simple rules behind all of this phenomenon. And what us, us scientists do is we're trying to discover these simple rules. Um, but what we learn from the what we learn from the fractals is if we know these simple rules, it does not necessarily mean that we understand the system, but we understand the rules at least. Okay, here's another thing about scale invariance. How big is that? What is that? Sorry. Can we go Question. back to um, the, the last equation? That one? Yeah. What does it mean? That means, that is a description, a mathematical description of any of these functions. This is y, this is x. We, if we put a graph like that on the board, we always say this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. y is the dependent variable, x is the independent variable. Why? Because y depends on x. In this case, well, let's take this one here, it's probably easier to understand. The, pr the probability of the occurrence of a word depends on the, on, the, on the ranking of the word. So the first word is the, that's its probability. So it's m just a constant then? m is a constant and b is a constant. m is the constant where it cuts through here, and b is the, the, gradient. the, the gradient, the slope. Okay, here, my favorite one, scale invariance. What is that? It's something with sand, yeah? But it could be sand on a, on a beach, it could be sand on a Mars, it could be um, a desert. Another example here, um, all versions of self-similarity imply scalar and fractals have no natural size. By contrast, the Euclidean objects like circles or spheres have a size. That's why uh, pictures of, of natural the world often includes Euclidean objects to set the scales. Lens caps are common in geology. This is a geological object. What, what do you think, how big is that? How, how much is it from here to here? Is it a centimeter, a meter, or 10 meters? 
you have no clue that's the whole point that's why people put a lens cap on here to show how big that is because everybody immediately knows ah this must be about this size so this must be about a meter but you cannot see in a scale invariant world and our world is scale invariant if you haven't got additional information you don't know how big something is so why is that important for us well as I said already here's our lung and here's a river data because they solve a problem that's why the world looks like it is not to be pretty but to solve a problem and the problem is the same namely use the, the fewest number of path fewest number of path lengths to to, um, to drain that area or in the lung uh, fewest number of material to, s to, to reach um, the furthest the biggest volume every cell in your body is a maximum of five cells away from a blood vessel ha however the whole system of blood vessels only occupies five percent of your body if you wanted to do that mechanically it's completely impossible the only way to do a system to solve a system like that is to use a fractal approach a very simple rule with branching and that will generate this kind of um, of, of system I think we've seen enough that I don't need to go into the coastline length um, but what does that lead to it leads to something called emergence we have simple rules and something emerges from that which is bigger than the sum of the part of the rules okay so we know all the rules something bigger emerges Let's make some examples of that for the for the wisdom of the crowd of swarm intelligence S wisdom of the crowd um, simple example is who wants to be a millionaire is that still on Chris Terrence is he still alive can't believe it do you know they they have three jokers one is the telephone joker one is the ask a friend yeah one is the 50 50 and the third one is ask the audience now the audience is not experts they're all people like you and me turns out the audience is a 90 per 91 percent correct although every individual member of the audience is not better than you and me and not better than the person is sitting in front on average they are good this is, is a similar or actually the same phenomenon as what we discussed before you've got a lot of agents let's call them agents these people and you've got a simple rule in this case the simple rule is we just ask them all their opinion and people on average perform much better than every individual that's why group work is better than individual work as simple as that another thing is ant colonies for example ants are not very intelligent do you think what a single ant, ant can do is not a lot but ant colonies have taken over the world they are the most successful things on the planet and you can argue that an ant that's not a swarm is it an ant colony is, is quite intelligent for example if they drag a big um, animal into their their hive um, say that they, they, they captured a grasshopper and you've got 150 uh, ants sitting around there and the nest is here none of these ants know exactly where the nest is but they all have a rough idea where it is so they will all push so this will push in this direction this will push in this direction this and that and that and that and if you add all of that together the animal will exactly go towards the nest so if I throw one ant here on the table and it will just randomly walk away if I throw 100 ants here on the table nothing much will happen if I throw 100,000 ants here they will start a colony they will start growing mushrooms they will start <coughs> controlling the temperature in their hive they will form offsprings they will do the most clever things but one individual ant is stupid so what does that have in common all of these things name we have very simple individual players ants or brain cells that's another example obviously uh, we have a very small number of simple rules well the ant isn't that simple but it's, it's still simple compared to many other things and we have near neighbor interaction so uh, ants only um, talk to other ants next to them and all of that results in something which is way above 
the individuals. I call that a bottom-up, so not a top-down emergence. Bottom-up because there is n there's no God making the rules. The ants don't make the rules. The rules emerge from nothing that was there. I find that the simple most fascinating fact and probably even socially and culturally the biggest turning point in human history potentially. Um, because what we see in, in, in our communication is exactly that. And I will go on about Facebook, no, about Wikipedia again and you know my opinion on that. Because this is an example for that. Wikipedia has been shown to be as good as Brit Encyclopedia Britannica. So you've got the top-down approach, you've got the, the, the hairy silverbacks writing the articles in the Encyclopedia Britannica, or you've got the approach of the 100,000 ants writing parts of a Wikipedia page. And the Wikipedia page is self-controlling, bottom-up, mm. it reaches the same quality. Another example is IMDB, for example. You know IMDB, movie database. Wh where do you look if you want to know how good a film is? IMDB. I assume. I do. <laughs> Most people do. Why? Because it's a good recommendation. Why? Not because some critics say, the BBC critic, that with an, with, without their hairs. Do you know that? Who, who believes him? Nobody. You believe what 100,000 other people have see it, said on IMDB. That's what bottom-up intelligence is. There's an emerging property coming out of these simple agents with simple rules that will have a better opinion than the experts. And this is changing the world because we can't communicate like that in, in the meantime. Right. Here's some, some of these simple rules. So give you, I think I've got three examples. Uh, how do we make a pair of lungs? Well, we start with a big pipe with mm -hmm. a radius mm -hmm. R and we let it grow until it has a specific length, actually not a length, but a ratio of length to ra um, uh, radius. So let's say five. It becomes five times longer than its radius and then it branches in two random directions. But the branches are a bit smaller. And then you do that again. You have a smaller arm and you grow five times the length of the, of the radius and you branch again. You repeat the thing at infinitum and you get a pair of lungs. It's a bit more complicated like that, but you get the idea. Here's another example. Um, it's called the cellular automata. These th things have made a lot of, 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 of um, impact in the 2000s. My girl, guy called Wolfram, there's actually a sign outside here, Wolfram Mathematica, he well, he written a book, it's called The New Kind of Science, because he wants to explain the world in a different way. And he uses these things as a, as a, as a, as a model for that, and as a tool for explaining the world. I, I don't think it works like that, but they're fascinating. You'll see some of them later. Here's the rules. You've got eight rules. You always start with counting blocks. You've got them on the first line. And if you have three of them, they can only have eight combinations. And these are all the different combinations that they can have. So all up be white, one is black, that one is black, and so on. Yeah, you, you, you get the story. And depending on these three, you make the next one either white or black. As simple as it can get. E now, it turns out that you can make humongously complex patterns with these things. And in fact, you'll discover some of these patterns. They can be very trivial, they can be very boring. They can be chaotic, or they can be just on the sweet spot that we're looking for, where something interesting happens. Here's another from the brain. It's called radioglial cells in brain development. So in the very early stages, when you haven't got brain cells yet, they're all just lumbering around here, the, the, the brain cells. Uh, the radioglial cells, they're not neurons, they're glial cells, so they don't do anything, but they, they are key progenitor cells in the developing of the nervous system. They, they walk, no, not walk, what's the word? They, they move through the brain. They start off here, and they move to specific positions. Now, why do they do that? Because they follow some gradient of some uh, chemicals that the, the brain expresses at certain stages. And what happens? All the neurons that are in their path will follow them. And that is called scaffolding. So their role is to scaffold neural migration. So they lead the neuron from, from your toe up to the brain. How else does the axon get there? 
because it follows one of these radioglial cells and that just follows a chemical gradient. Simple rule, it's a repulsion attraction rule, but in this case it's an attraction. There are other rules as well, the brain is not quite that simple, but they, but they basically boils down to two things can attract each other or two things can repel each other. And if you make that complex enough, and you have many of them, you get um, complex structures, fractal structures. And if you measure the connections, they have already said that, they happen to be, or they turn out to, to follow power laws, which means most of the connections are short, some connections are long. Okay, so what's the difference between us and a fruit fly? You've heard of the Human Genome Project, actually has been um, finished when? 2005? 10 years ago? Correct me if I'm wrong. When the first human was completely, gen the, the genome was, 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 was um, uh, deciphered. Now you all have heard the how many percent of genes do we share with the chimpanzees? Yeah, 98 or 99 percent, yes. Mm. Which is maybe not surprising, they're quite similar to us, but the interesting story is where, what are the 2 percent or the 1 percent that are actually different? And you would think there's a huge difference between a chimpanzee and a, and, a, and a human. Just look at them. I mean, there are a few genes that code for more hair, okay? But there are humans that have more hair as well. Um, you f find that half of the differences between chimpanzees and humans is that chimpanzees have more genes coding smell because we're just not as good as them in smelling things. So where is all of the differences in brain coded genetically? There's one very logical change in the genes and that is the, there's a gene that codes, I forgot what its name is, uh, one of these genes have always funky names, that was one of these funky names, that codes how often things branch in neurons. And in the, in the chimpanzees, that number is, I think, four, and in the human, it's five. What does it mean? It means that the human brain, uh, yes, human brain branches one more time than the chimpanzee's brain. That's the only difference. There is no difference in quality, only in quantity, genetically. But the difference, and in the fruit fly you have a similar story, just you have just only one branch or something like that, I don't know. The, 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 the rules that the fruit fly and the chimpanzees and we follow are the same. We've got the same neurons, we've got the same neurotransmitters, we've got the same ions for, for membrane channels, we've got the same eyes, we've got, not the same ears, no, but we've got a lot of the things that are the same. The rules are the same, but the outcome is very different. And what's the difference? Size, scale, emergence. Emergence comes from scale. If you put a lot more into it, if you put 100,000 ants on the table, they will do something interesting. If you put, well, 100 billion nerve cells into a human body, it will start doing art or program computers or play football. All things that the chimpanzee doesn't do. Yes? Yeah, I come back to that. I come back to that. Yeah. Here's my favorite one. This is, this is funnily has also something to do with scale invariance. I always select the ones with the nice music. What is that? These are starlings. It's in, in Oxford, close to Oxford, I think. This. You find that everywhere. And it's just beautiful. What has that got to do with complexity? Well, obviously it's complex. But it follows all of our things that we have. These are a lot of agents, and they are very, very simple rules. But we discover one additional ingredient now that makes all the difference, and that only has been um, realized recently. Why do they do that? It's not quite clear, by the way, but people assume they do that to avoid predators because of the, of the um, they, they get confused. Here, here it is, by the way, that's the, that's the falcon.
He doesn't catch any. <laughs> so the birds, obviously, the birds individually are quite, probably quite stupid. But put them together in a swarm, they develop swarm intelligence with a very simple avoidance rule. Stop the music now. Check it, check it. Right, what has it got to do with the brain? Self-organized criticality. Hang on, um, back to your question. What has that got to do with self-similarity? With the scale invariance. <coughs> The, the first part of the answer is the scale invariance is is in here. The, how many times you branch is how far you are away from it. You can go infinitely. The brain doesn't do that infinitely. The scale invariance always we use that word scale invariance if we have at least three or four orders of magnitude. So if you scale in thousandfold and you still see the same structure, we call it self um, self uh, scale invariant. That's what certainly the point here. Certainly the point here. We we see something for the for the uh, for the neural side in a second as well. So it's different in the brain. It, it is the same. It's scale invariant. Absolutely. You you branch out. It always looks like a um, it always looks like the same structure. So if the chimps, for example, have the same structure as us and the same genes and neurotransmitters, it's just that we've got more of them. Yeah. Is that branch simply different? more branches? Yeah. yeah. That is that that is the main difference. That's right the main difference. It's not the all of the story obviously yeah, yeah. but it is the main story. So the point here is what's called SOC, self-organized criticality. That's the last ingredient to my story here. Every complex system, we put these things together. We know what a complex system now is. We know what a critical point is. This is something where something interesting happens. And it turns out that every natural system, well, most natural systems, work at exactly a critical point. This is fascinating because it's exactly the opposite of physics. In physics, everything is boring. If you put two things together, they do something boring because they settle down in a low energy state. Neural, no, uh, human, no. Biological systems don't do that. Nothing in biology ever settles down into a, 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 a constant or a, a boring state. We always operate, we're not exploding, we're not operating in a chaotic state but we're also not becoming crystallized when we sit, but we do something. And that's a sweet spot where it seems, well, where, where, where complexity happens and um, where um, self-organized, where, where, where self-organization happens, where the swarm of the birds, where the single bird becomes a swarm, where the ant co colony becomes a colony, or where the brain starts thinking. This guy has, has described it the first time, Danish physicist Per Buck, proclaimed that perhaps the brain was less complicated than we thought, but we haven't really understood what the co where the complexity comes from. And he made this example of a sand pile, and I'll show you just a two seconds of that, because people don't assume otherwise what a sand pile model is. Now this is a sand pile model. <laughs> what has that got to do with the brain? Here's a, here's a round disc, and there's a... Uh, uh, what's it? And uh, you put sand in there, and the sand uh, falls down onto the the, the the pile. What's that got to do with the brain? This is a perfect example of a self-organized criticality. The system, if you leave it to itself, starts doing something interesting. Now, if you start with an empty empty plate, nothing interesting will happen. The sand will pile up, up to a point where obviously you put more sand on, some will fall down. But is that a smooth process? For every sand cone that you put on top, one falls down? No, because you get something which is called avalanches. Avalanches mean you put one cone of sand and it is super critical and suddenly a whole avalanche falls down. No, it's not chaos. Chaos it would be if you put one down and the whole thing explodes or nothing happens or something. No, no, this is far away from chaos. This is just at the sweet spot between boring and chaos. And in between is the state of self-organized criticality, SOC. Namely, if you count the number of, of sand cones that fall down, they follow a power law. You have a few big avalanches and many, many, many small avalanches. What has it got to do with the brain? Just to make the connection that you're not falling asleep. You can see the brain is exactly doing the same thing. You put an, a neuron into a cortical column, 
and it fires, most of the time nothing will happen, but some of the time the whole column will be set on fire, a light, you have a big avalanche and everything is active. And if you measure that, it will follow a power law. But the whole thing only happens at a very special point in, in nature. The self-organized criticality is put forward by 1986, Per Buck, Chao Tung, Kurt Wiesenfeld. It is considered to be the most prominent mechanism by which complexity arises in nature. And uh, the concepts have been enthusiastically applied across fields from, what is it, geophysics, I showed you some, physical cosmology, evolutionary biology, ecology, bioinspiring computing, optimization, mathematics, economics, quantum gravity, sociology, solar physics, plasma physics, neuroscience, everything. You can effectively, everything where you have power laws, yeah, remember Facebook is governed as a self-critical, as a self-organized organized critical state. If Facebook would be boring, which means nobody puts anything up, it wouldn't be interesting. If it was chaotic, everybody puts up oh, random stuff up all the time, nobody would read it. It's interesting just at the sweet spot because the right number of people put the right information on there. Same with the Internet Movie Database. And that's the, that's the magic. And the, 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 this is linked to scale invariance. Here I've got this, this, this example that Bert's won, but it's getting late now. I'm just skimming over that. It shows, this is just the example that shows that it all has all these in ingredients that Bert's won. Um, we have the, the scale invariance in there. We've got a critical points in there and blah, 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 blah. Don't worry about that. We've got the forest fire. Um, this is a mathematical, it's not a real forest fire, it's a mathematical model of a forest fire that you'll discover actually in the exercises as well. Um, that models with the very simple rules, namely a burning tree or cell uh, turns into an empty tree. A tree will burn if at least one neighbor is burning. A tree ignites with probability F if no neighbor is burning. And an empty spell is filled with a tree that grows with the probability P. And you get nice patterns like that out of that that actually are not that dissimilar from, from real uh, forest fire. But that's not the point. The point is that the structures that you have on here are exactly, if you tune them to the right parameters, it becomes um, pretty. It becomes interesting. Yeah. And here, back to the scale invariance scale um, in the brain, because this is where my, my research links in, because as we already had, we knew that, uh, the example in the vision. Wh what is scale invariance in vision? A lot of things, but the thing that I pick out here is our ability to see things in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 orders of magnitude of light. 12 orders of magnitude. This is, 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 is a huge rate. We see the same thing. If you see a face in front of you, you can see it as the same face. It's scale uh, invariant from the scale of the luminance that you have. And there are lots of tricks that the, that the, that the, that the system does. The one of the tricks is the pupilla that reduces the amount of light. But there is that maybe reduces it to, to three orders, or that reduces three orders of magnitude, but you're still left with nine. And it is not clear today what the brain is doing to achieve that scale invariance. And my, my other example of my heart Obviously, sound intensity. This is in decibel, so this is a logarithmic scale. Yeah. Again, we've got 12 orders of magnitude of sound intensity. And if you hear somebody talking at threshold, he will say exactly the same thing as if he's shouting to you at 120 decibels. So the information is completely scale invariant over 120 decibels. And we discover power laws. Wherever we look, we see power laws. Here's one. This is not a this is a linear scale and a linear threshold, but if you put that on a log scale and a log scale, sure as hell these will become straight lines. Um, and in this case, this gives us a hint of how that works. Namely, you've got the, the time in the dark raises the threshold, oh, sorry, reduces the threshold. Or in other words, if you expose them to light, the threshold will be higher. And how does it do that over time? With a power law. So the power law 
is the key to understanding how the scale invariance is actually achieved. The brain uses that, obviously uses that, to expand the range of, of vision and of hearing. Here's the example from hearing. These are all data that I measured. These, um, if you play a sound, 50 millisecond, 100 millisecond sound, the neurons will spike a lot at the beginning, but they will drop down. Guess what function they follow when they drop? A power law function. They get bored by the sound, so they become less sensitive, which allows the auditory system to code more amplitudes. That's the take home message here, that the, the whole thing about the, the complexity leads us to maybe a better understanding of perceptual things, because we know the, the two research questions for the next five years that nobody knows at the moment. We do not know if the brain operates near a critical state. I, I said that as it, if it was a fact, I believe in that, but there's no evidence for that. So there's a good experiment for anybody clever out there to actually show that this is the case. Second one, what are the neural processes that allow scale invariance and perception? Um, we, we know that our perception, not only our perception, our behavior is fractal, is scale invariant. There's an experiment where you show, um, where you let somebody estimate a time duration, say one second. Can you do that? Yeah, you can do that quite well. I let you estimate 10 seconds, and then I count what your error is that you make in that, and I plot that error, and how often you make it. You make very large errors, very infrequently, and you make small errors very frequently. The whole thing, sure as hell, follows a power law. So obviously your brain is geared up not only to perceive things according to this fractal nature of, of, the, of the universe, um, but it also behaves like that. And why shouldn't it? Because it obviously solves a lot of problems. And we know from neural recordings, that's just one example of what I already said, um, I said that the, the, the fire probability follows a power law, but also the time delay between the activities of a neuron will follow um, power laws. So these power laws, or this scale invariance, which is immediately connected, is obviously there in, in our behavior, in neural recordings, in the neurons, but we do not understand really how that leads to this range of, of, of perception. So I'll leave this lecture with these two questions. And here I've got three activities to find out about Game of Life, Cellular Automata and the Forest Fire. Uh, and I ask you to have a look at them, enjoy it because it's good fun playing with those. Uh, understand what's going on, what are the rules. They're all very, very simple rules that they follow. Usually it fits into one or two lines. Um, and here's a little trick, or a little question. Find out how to produce a state where you have no trees. Okay, you'll understand if you go to this website. And let's make five minute breaks. And I'll help you with it. together in groups with the, uh, with the laptops? And I'm here to answer questions.